The U.S. Open has a new American queen. Ezekiel Elliott gets a reprieve and Josh Brown gets more time. For Michael Bennett, police brutality is personal. Mikhail Prokhorov is willing to be more flexible. And who and what are off topic this week? All that and more on What's the 411 Sports coming right up. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us here at What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. There's so much to talk about so we're just going to hop right into it. There was black girl magic on display at the 2017 U.S. Open. At this year's Open, while Serena Williams was on maternity leave after giving birth to a baby girl, her sister Venus, Madison Keys, and Sloane Stevens made their presence known. This was the first time in uh, the U.S. women's tennis history that there were two African-American women's center court who did not have the last name Williams. And Sloane Stevens, congratulations for winning it all. She beat Madison Keys 6-3, 6-0. And on the men's side, Spaniard Rafael Nadal beat South Africa's Kevin Anderson 6-3, 6-3, and 6-4. Mike, what do you think about what happened at the U.S. Open? Well, we'll go with the ladies first. And uh, Sloane Stevens was just remarkable. I mean, it's just phenomenal, the show that she put on. And it's almost like... It was unfortunate that Serena wasn't there. Of course, look, she had her baby. She wasn't able to be there and everything. But it, it, it's almost as if this torch has been passed uh, to this new rising star who's certainly marketable. thought it was very fitting, too, with everything that happened in, with Florida, with the hurricane and everything. She's a, 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 you know, she's from that area, from South Florida and everything. So that was, I, I thought the whole Open in general was a lot of fun. The, the whole Open was just a lot of fun to watch over the course of the, the time that they had it. But Sloane Stevens, for me, Rafael Nadal, I mean, we all, no, we knew what he was before coming into this, but Sloan Stevens, I think, that's what we'll remember from the 2017 U.S. Open, women's and men's. Yeah. Also, it's notable to mention that this was the first time in 36 years in the women's U.S. Open history that there were four Americans in the tennis version of the Final Four. So good girl good for america to sh you know, have a nice showing and you know my sisters were doing their things and i think that you know you mentioned that sloan stevens could be the heir apparent i think we should just kind of slow down a little bit it was a great win for her but a one grand slam does not a serena williams make so we're just gonna see how sloan develops over the course of time because you know not to throw any shade on the young lady because she did accomplish something great but according to my calculations with the help of wikipedia uh, serena williams slow stevens is 24 and she won her first grand slam serena williams was 18 when she won her first and by the time serena turned 24 by my calculations she's already she won seven <laughs> single grand slam titles that's remarkable yeah so i just you know i i I know it makes good for good conversation and gives us a job to do, but I just don't like when there's automatically people are looking for the next so-and-so. Can't Sloan be just like the next star? Why does she have to be Serena Williams? Especially so early in her career, but... That's a good point, because Serena was such a phenom when she was just a young teenager, and, and here she still is um, up until now with everything, with having the pregnancy, and we, we wish her the best. Yeah. But I hope she gets back on the the court soon yeah and you know serena might be one of those once in a lifetime type um or maybe once in a generation type players like a lebron or mj so absolutely well keisha we talk about the big trade in the nba now with kyrie irving who has left the building irving is now with the boston celtics in exchange for isaiah thomas jay crowder and center ante zisic the Brooklyn Nets, 2018 pick, by the way, of the Boston Celtics, and of course, the 2020 pick from Boston as well. So, Keisha, I ask you, did the Cavaliers get a good deal, or will there be buyer's remorse? No, I really like this deal for the Cavs, and I think it closed the gap between the Cavaliers and the Warriors because, let's face it, every team is really aiming to build a team that's going to beat the Warriors because as of right now and maybe for the next couple seasons while the Warriors – team as presently constructed can be intact they're the gold standard to beat so I think that this trade brought the Cavs a little closer that got Jay Crowder who is at minimum a solid defender he can play multiple positions it's going to give them depth off the bench because it's projected that he'll come off the bench um, that's Crowder and Ante Zizic pardon me if I um, mispronounce your name 
um, if he's able to provide any kind of productivity, that's only going to help bolster the the lineup and uh, give the Cavs what they needed, which was some depth and some pr more productivity outside of LeBron, Kevin Love, and Kyrie Irving, who was once on the team. And I think in terms of uh, point guard to point guard, I think that's as close as an even trade as you're going to get when you trade when you swap Isaiah Thomas for Kyrie Irving. And I mean uh, the questionable. Part of the deal is the health of Isaiah Thomas, who has, a, who's nursing a hip injury or recovering from a hip injury, and there's no timetable as to when he's going to come back. So that's the only variable. But if Isaiah Thomas can come back on the court, he's going to give you productivity. And this is a contract year for him. He's playing for that big, that next big contract, and he's going to be even, I think, even more ferocious. On a side note, one of the things that really surprised me with this was a lot of people throwing Danny Ainge under the bus. I think most of the people who followed the NBA were sort of just relieved that this trade was able to get done, but I heard some people saying that, you know, Danny Ainge probably could have gotten more. From my standpoint, I think Danny Ainge really made a good move here. I think that we don't know necessarily what the whole, and this is, you know, with the, the whole long-term injury as far as Isaiah Thomas is concerned, but I think going into next season, Look, like you said, the Cavs will probably wind up being the favorite to go ahead and win the East. But the thing is, the Boston Celtics are loaded, and they're ready, I think, to go ahead and make a push at the Cavs. I think, to end it on this, this trade is good for the NBA. You don't want these stars bickering with one another on the same team, dragging out. Certainly, it makes good for good sports talk shows and good sports talk radio, but you want to see teams... And, and, and star players get moved on to where they really want to be so that you can market that type of matchup and that type of player in an environment like that. Well, Keisha, we go to the gridiron where Dallas running back Ezekiel Elliott can actually play for the Cowboys this season despite Roger Goodell handing down a six-game suspension. Now, Elliott was... A lot of people are accusing him for this domestic violence issue, which has dragged on for some time now. But the NFL Players Association took the NFL to court to get a temporary restraining order over the process by which Goodell came to Elliott's punishment and won. Are you surprised, Keisha, at the turn of these events? I am surprised that the NFL and Roger Goodell have seemingly bumbled another investigation and, an, and mishandled another case of domestic violence because the Players Association is really attacking the process by which the, the suspension came and really hammering the point that um, NFL lead investigator Kiera Roberts' opinion was not um, considered by Goodell. It was either her message did not reach him, or it was summarily dismissed by Goodell, and Keira Roberts did not believe and would not recommend suspension for Ezekiel Elliott due to what she thought was, um, what do you call it? In, um, she casted doubt on the credibility of the witness. And the Players Association is also talking that, or disputing the, the handling of it because the their lawyers weren't able to depose the alleged victim, nor Roger Goodell. So I just don't understand at the, on the heels of Ray Rice and this, and the investigation that took a year, maybe a little over a year, where that's plenty of time to cross your T's and dot your I's that the NFL has bumbled this. And once again, it shows that they, they don't really understand. They didn't learn from the first time or they just are trying to figure this out as they go along. And it's making everybody look bad. Yeah, I think what the NFL should have done all along was during Hall of Fame week when they issued out the suspension, it shouldn't have been six games, I felt like it should have been one, maybe two maximum, because even if they did go ahead, Ezekiel Elliott and the Cowboys appeal this, or the NFLPA actually, um, at least if it gets overturned, it does. You don't look. You don't have as much egg on your face with a six-game suspension as opposed to one or two. Now, just because Ezekiel Elliott is allowed to play this season, I know you and I, who are Giant fans, are not happy about that. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean that this is something that is going to go away. This kid obviously has some some issues that he certainly needs to work on. I don't know if therapy is going to be what helps it, but he's had three instances now going back since his time at Ohio State where he gets wrapped up in this in a lot of trouble and usually it's with women right. so I think that this is something that could certainly play out I like Ezekiel Elliott I don't think that you know I don't think that he's necessarily a bad guy that's not to say that he you know 
a lot of his character can be questioned with a lot of these incidents that have happened. But for the NFL, and especially America's team, which is one of the most prominent teams in the NFL, this is a guy that you really want to keep a careful eye on because he's more than a rising star in the NFL now. He's certainly arrived, and he's, he's going to be here to stay for some time now. So we're going to move from one domestic violence incident in the NFL to another, and the league quietly issued a six-game suspension against Josh Brown, who was a former New York Giants kicker. The NFL reopened an investigation and found new information that prompted the uh, six-game suspension. Now, um, and they g gave the suspension based on they, their findings that Brown violated the personal conduct policy. Now, if you remember, um, when reports of domestic violence first surfaced with Brown and his uh, wife, and he, she may now be his ex-wife at this point, um, they, they issued a one-game suspension. So, Mike, what do you think precipitated the NFL issuing this six-game suspension? And Josh Brown did not, it has chosen not to appeal, and do you think that's the right decision by Brown? Well, as far as it being the right decision by Brown, I'll I'll commend the guy, even though he's had these issues with the with with his wife, ex-wife, uh, and there's no right for any man to go ahead and hit a woman, hit, hit, you know, hit, hit his ex girl do what he did to his ex-girlfriend. It's just completely sick and it's wrong. Uh, I can at least commend the guy that he's accepted this. He's not going to go ahead and appeal. He's not going to fight the NFL. You know, Keisha, what a lot of people are saying is is that this suspension with Josh Brown is really the NFL trying to save face. Um, and of course, with this whole Ezekiel Elliott mess that's happened over the course of the last couple of weeks, this is just sort of the NFL kind of going out and just kind of looking for the, some bad guys that they can go ahead and punish. For me, the interesting though, thing, though, is, you know, Josh Brown is a 38-year-old unsigned kicker with no, that doesn't belong to a team. Uh, and I'm not saying that the NFL is picking on him. This guy, actually, I believe, does deserve to be, be punished. But in some ways, I feel like this is almost too little too late. I mean, I don't... I'm going to disagree with you slightly in the fact that I don't think it's the NFL picking on Josh Brown. The, it is the NFL doing what they should have done in the first place. And this is once again showing that how haphazard their disciplinary actions are and how how and why the players get so mad at Goodell because there just doesn't seem any to be any rhyme or reason. And I don't know what event precipitated it. Maybe it was Elliot's, Ezekiel Elliott's lawyer and, you know, any decent lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, but when I first saw, yeah. saw the one-game suspension of Josh Brown, I'm like, wait a minute. And then he gave Ezekiel six. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How are you doling out this punishment? You had a new policy that's mandated the first offense, you get six games. Under that new policy, Josh Brown found, you know, fell under it, and it was determined that the league was new about this because they moved the ex-wife from one hotel to That's another right. yeah. after she complained that Josh Brown was being inappropriate, trying to break down the door, causing all sorts of chaos, and she was fearful for her safety and that of her children. The NFL knew this and yet didn't say anything, and then when they decided to hand down a punishment, it's one game. Now, Ezekiel Elliott, the second offender under this new policy, gets six games. And then when you, you can even go back to Greg Hardy, when he... Um, was first given a t uh, suspension it was 10 games but they gave it based on a policy that wasn't even in effect when he had his issues with the law and his ex-girlfriend so it the nfl is all over the place they are retroactively doing what they should have done trying to save their face which is not going to happen because they look bad just in general going to another unfortunate incident and it's involving Seattle Seahawks Michael Bennett and he had a run-in with the Las Vegas police um, after leaving a nightclub and he was detained by police officers and he was uh, he says that an officer um, had a gun pointed to his head and told Bennett that he would quote unquote blow his bleeping head off and um, Mike I ask you this on the heels of this unfortunate incident, where do you think the NFL will stand in this particular issue and any other unfortunate instances like this? Well, shockingly, Roger Goodell has come out and supported Michael Bennett uh, to a lot of people's surprise, surprise, including myself, saying that he's one of the great examples of this league. And I, for me, that was just surprising because the NFL has been very careful the way they've dealt with a lot of these social issues that have gone on over the course of the last couple of seasons. Um, I, 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 
Look, Roger Goodell is easy in so many ways for me to just throw onto the bus, but I will give him credit for that. In the meantime, you know, they're really just kind of waiting for this investigation to happen, to, to kind of play itself out with everything that happened in Las Vegas over uh, the, what, the, the weekend when they had the fight and, and, and everything that went on there. Um, but it's still, I don't care what happened as far as everything that happened off camera with that incident with Michael Bennett. It's sickening. It, it, you know, and this is, I mean, these, these are things like this are continuing to happen. And then when you see it happen with an athlete, a, a star athlete, um, it really just comes as a lot, of, a lot of, not necessarily even surprise anymore, but just almost like I, I was aghast watching the video. Even, you know, Martel, you know his brother was, was saying how emotional he got himself. So uh, I think the NFL is improving in some ways. I do give uh, Roger Goodell some credit here for the way that he supported Bennett. But overall, as far as how this investigation plays out, uh, there's no question that with everything that happened with these police officers, something something went completely wrong, and it's unacceptable. Yeah, I mean, before I, I begin, I'd just like to say that, you know, thank goodness that nothing happened to Michael Bennett because we've seen how sometimes these things can go the opposite way where it's a loss of life. And, you know, I'm just really happy and I'm sure his family is very grateful that the situation you know resulted in him coming back home you know the big contrast between the NBA and the NFL is that recently NBA Commissioner Adam Silver and NBA Players Association Executive Director Michelle Roberts are encouraging players to speak out on social issues, stating to NBA players, none of us operate in a vacuum. Critical issues that affect our society also impact you directly. Fortunately, you are not the only the world's greatest basketball players. You have the real power to make a difference in the world, and we want you to know that the Players Association and the league are always available to help you figure out the most meaningful way to make the difference. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Our photo of the week is a picture of Brooklyn Nets players Jeremy Lin and Karis LeVert in Taiwan. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. So now we're going to get in our New York state of mind and talk about some stories that are close to home. Brooklyn Nets owner Mikhail Prokhorov is ready to sell the team. Initially, Prokhorov was going to sell minority stake, but he has now altered that plan a little bit to first sell up to 49% of the team, and then the remaining 51% shortly thereafter. Some sources say that Prokhorov was encouraged by the recent sale of the Houston Rockets for $2.2 billion. So, Mike, I ask you, do you think that the Nets losing record has anything to do with um, Prokhorov's inability or uh, the slowness of his ability to sell the franchise? 100%. I think that when he bought this team and when he took over the Nets, uh, and of course at that point they were in New Jersey prior to the move to Brooklyn and everything, uh, the Nets actually weren't in the best spot, but they weren't as bad as they are in a, a position of as right now. And I think if, as, as far as what they've been able to do to market this team since they've come to Brooklyn, uh, it, it, it's not where, it want, where they want to be right now. Now, that doesn't mean that things are on the come up because they have made some positive changes in the offseason and everything, but there's no doubt that here's a guy um, that, uh, that 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 without a doubt that people not to mention not only are the Nets and you know just in a dismal sort of um, in a place that they've been in the last couple of years but there might just be some people that say I don't want to do business with this guy Prokhorov just because well wait a second he's never here he leaves the country he's gone five months out of the year he's you know he might he might be so that could be another issue as well um, I think, wow, I, I had a couple of thoughts while you were, were talking, and I, I wonder if the sale, the, uh, him breaking up the sale in two parts is something that maybe will work to his advantage. Look, if he gets somebody to first buy the 49%, right, and let's just say they're able to make some turnarounds, and get the franchise moving in the right direction. And I think the, some of the infrastructure is already there with the hiring of Sean Marks, and you've got Trajan Langdon and some other, and Coach Kenny Atkinson already there. What if the 49% person's got these great ideas to turn it around, and then what if, I mean, I don't know if they could do this, though. What if Procrow was like, oh, I like where this is going. I'm going to keep my 51%. But I think if I, re if I remember correctly that it's going to be a, a 
a done deal. It's like the 49, and then you you buy the rest of the team, and he remains owner of the Barclays Center. So that was just one thought, but I don't think that'll happen. But I just am wondering what the final numbers will be when the sale is finally done. I don't know if they're going to get close to the 2.2 billion. I don't know if they're going to get to the 2 billion mark because when you look at the recent sales of the Clippers and the Rockets for 2 billion and 2.2 billion respectively, these were franchises who had recent successes. Um and so that bolsters it. And while Brooklyn is in a major market, they just don't have the cachet. And it's kind of strange because the Knicks over the past few years have not done very much, but yet they have the cachet and they filled the Madison Square Garden even when they're losing. So we're going to go across the bridge. I like to use the Manhattan Bridge from Brooklyn. We'll go off to the bridge and we're going to talk about the New York Knicks and Carmelo Anthony. My Carmelo Anthony, we've talked about him a lot over the course of the past few weeks, months, and he's still a New York Nick. And he's projected to be a New York Nick at the start of the season. Mike, um, if he is going to be, at the start of the season, a New York Nick, do you think he will finish the season as a New York Nick? And then also, there's been talk regarding the point guard position. Jarrett Jack and Trey Burke have been mentioned as possible signings at the point guard position. What do you think of either one of them for the team? Uh, Trey Burke, I just don't see him being a good fit. The guy really hasn't come up, you know amounted to anything since he's uh, been in the NBA. Jared Jack, even though he's dealt with the injuries, might be someone that would be interesting for the Knicks to bring on. Uh, he's had some good veteran leadership, and the guy's had a very good career since coming out of Georgia Tech. So I would look into that. As far as Carmelo Anthony is concerned, I'm just crossing my fingers, and I hope that they can unload this guy at some point prior to when this season starts. But I grow more and more pessimistic every day because I just don't think that, that the – you know, the stock for Carmelo Anthony certainly has decreased over the last several seasons. There's no question about that. Uh, and the two big options right now, still at this point, are, well, Portland's an option. It seems to be growing a little bit. Carmelo Anthony says that he might be open to the possibility of going there. And then Houston. Uh, but certainly, if the Houston Rockets were really sold on the possibility of bringing Carmelo Anthony there, they probably would have pulled that trigger by now. So if the Knicks don't make this deal and they have Carmelo at the beginning of training camp, and into the regular season. As far as whether they can find a way to get rid of him during the season, I think it would be more difficult uh, than it is now uh, because it's just harder to pick and choose the pieces while the season is going on. In the meantime, anything can happen. The last thing I'll say is I think that everyone was excited for the New York Knicks fans when they got rid of Phil Jackson, but it was almost like a gift and a curse because while they got rid of Phil Jackson, it's almost as though it kind of hurt their chances of, of getting rid of Carmelo Anthony because in my mind, if Car Phil Jackson were still here with the New York Knicks, there's no doubt that Carmelo Anthony would not still be here. I don't know. I mean, he stuck it out when Phil was here. He was he had his heels dug in. I'm not leaving. I'm staying. And Phil Jackson did not make it comfortable for Carmelo and Carmelo Anthony, he made it very clear that they he didn't want Carmelo Anthony here, and Carmelo has had his Jennifer <laughs> Holiday, and I'm telling you, I'm not going. Uh, I'm gonna stay right here. Jennifer Holiday, Dream Girls, Beyonce, Google, YouTube it. It's great. Um, <laughs> I will say that I think uh, Melo will be a New York Nick at the start of the season. Whether he'll finish the season is another story. And I'll just say quickly, I am very partial to Jarrett Jack, so I would love to see him on the court again in a New York uniform. So I'm rooting for him. And Trey Burke, you know, I root for you too as well. But I am very partial to Jarrett Jack, so I want to see him play again. <laughs> All right, baseball fans, Mike, there is some space between your New York Yankees and the Baltimore Orioles in for the wild card spot in the playoffs. I'm going to punt this to you. You are our resident Yankees fan, our resident baseball watcher, so you tell me if the Yankees get to the wild card spot, can they advance to the next round. They can. Uh, anything can happen, certainly, especially if you're hosting a game at home in the Bronx, uh, depending on who they would wind up playing, be it the Minnesota Twins, Seattle 
Seahawks, Seattle Mariners, <laughs> whoever it is that winds up uh, making that second wild card spot. Uh, and of course, right now the division is still not, you know, com- is still not complete. The Yankees are sandwiched right now in that first wild card spot, and then they're about maybe three, four games. Well, they're three games back of the Boston Red Sox in the American League East. I think now the big thing that the Yankees have is their starting pitching. It started to click. They played very well on the road over the course of the last seven to eight days. Um, I think that this team, if they can get hot, there's no question about it that they can make some noise. The Cleveland Indians scare me. The Houston Astros scare me. There's no doubt about that in the American League. But anything is up for grabs once the baseball playoffs begin. And I think that there's no doubt that with the offense that they have uh, and, and the rotation, they can certainly make some noise. But... The, the thing that everyone says about the Yankees that they have an edge over everybody else is their bullpen. And their bullpen, talent-wise, absolutely on paper, it's terrific. But it has been a disaster over the last couple of months. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Now we're going to go a little off topic, but we're going to stay on the subject of Carmelo Anthony. And Carmelo Anthony unexpectedly showed up at the launch of his exchange wife, Lala Anthony's Dedham line at Lord & Taylor in New York City. Carmelo proudly posted a photo of Lala on his Instagram account. Mike, do you think these two crazy kids can work it out and get back together? No, I think Lala is going to move on and not take him back. Look, I think Carmelo Anthony, you know, he's realized that maybe he's kind of burged a big bridge in his marriage with his wife and now he wants her back and everything and I give him some respect for the fact she's a beautiful woman that's the the, the mother of his son and all that but maybe just move on you know it's time for she at the same time while he is stuck in this rut as far as where am I going to go with the rest of my career am I ever going to win a championship it's this, he's in his early to mid 30s it's almost like there's this sense of malaise that's going on in his life a lot of uncertainty meanwhile for Lala Anthony her career is starting to boom. She's on the show's power for stars. Um, you know, she's 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 really making a name for herself. So it's almost as if why would she bring herself back down to his level when she's soaring with her career and doing so well? That's just my take on it. And she's also setting those thirst traps on social media. Those pictures are hot, 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 <laughs> hot. Making Carmelo sit up and take notice. Like, hey, girl, how you doing? Um, you know, as you were talking... Uh, the one thing that stuck out about what you said was that Carmelo is in this, you know, really turbulent and unsure time of his life in terms of his career, his marriage. And normally, you know, when one thing, one area of your life kind of is a little shaky, you have an, the other part that's more stable. He doesn't have that. So maybe, I mean, I'm not doubting that he, he um, I'm not doubting that he loves Lala, um, but maybe the fact that he's in this unstable time of his life is making him really want to reach out to her and have her close even more because she is a sense of stability for him. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Well, Mike, we have to say goodbye to our friends. I don't like it. Don't blame me, don't hate me, but you can keep up with us until we meet again next time by following us on Twitter and Instagram, friending us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to checking you out next week.